very, very proud to say, Les Roberts, who is an internationally known author and uh, has done a lot of books uh, based around Cleveland. And uh, Les, welcome. How you been doing? I've been doing great. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This yeah, I'm, I'm, we talked about this several weeks ago, Kathy and All I. All right, yeah. And uh, I said, if you can get Les Roberts on the show, this would be huge. And she said, I can do this. So she... <laughs> I asked you earlier. I got up at four o'clock in the morning. I was, was, was going to say you had to get up early. <laughs> oh, now, you boy. drove in from Cleveland. Uh, from Stowe, actually. Stowe, actually. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you found us okay, or you found her? Or what? I found her. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> She's not hard to find. <laughs> uh, Les, uh, got to ask you. Now, you started out not writing novels. You started out in the other end of uh, entertainment. Somebody told me that you wrote for uh, Andy Griffith. I wrote an Andy Griffith show, I wrote uh, a Lucy show, I wrote for The Man From U.N.C.L.E. Uh, mainly I wrote and produced, I was the first uh, head writer and producer of the Hollywood Squares, Hollywood way Square. back when it started. If anybody's out there old enough to remember that. <laughs> oh, I am. I'm old enough to remember that. Uh, how, did you, like, how did you get started writing for major shows like that? Uh, I was very fortunate. I was living in New York at the time. Uh, and I was asked to uh, do a couple of sketches for a, a, what I used to call a cabaret, a nightclub comedy show. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, I, I, I did that, and the morning after it opened, I got a call from uh, the William Morris Agency in New York, and I said, we'd like you to be a client. And I said, great. They got me you know, several uh, television shows on the East Coast, including the Jackie Gleason show. Oh, wow. I had to go down to... Um, Miami Beach to do that, mm -hmm. uh, but there wasn't that much going on in New York at the time, and I thought I got got to move to California, so I moved to Los Angeles, and I got, you know, I went and I talked to the uh, agency out there, and I told them all the wonderful things that I wanted to do with my life. I said, in the meantime, I said I need a job, <laughs> you know. so they got me a job writing a, uh, a, a game show on NBC called Showtime and it lasted for 15 weeks and it was canceled but it was replaced by another show the same producers called the Hollywood Squares. Wow, big time. And uh, my uh, boss then, Merrill Heater, uh, said to me and I, I just vividly remember the quote, he said, you want to hang around on the new show and be the producer kid? I was a kid. Uh, well, I didn't even know quite what a producer was, but I knew it had something to do with starlets in Hollywood, so I said, hey, no, that's <laughs> uh, And, you know, there I was with this huge show, and I met every, almost every celebrity alive back then. Yeah. You know, and uh, it was very exciting, and I did that for three years, and... Uh, Prior to that, Les, did you have a day job that got you, you know, because... When you're not in the business until you really hit it big like that, I mean, did, did you, how did you support yourself? Uh, oddly enough, I worked in bookstores and record stores. And, yeah. Uh, you know, just... Just make enough to get by. Right, right. And uh, all the time I was writing, uh, I also wanted to be an actor, and I did act for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, Anything significant? No. Or? No, I did a lot of plays. Yeah. And uh, uh, extras in, in uh, television shows. Right. You know, I wasn't going to make a living that way. Right. Uh, so I started writing, and I loved that. I did it for many years, and then somebody came to me uh, and said uh, that he was a producer, a movie producer, uh, and that he had these two investors, and they wanted to do, and I quote, a private eye movie like Casablanca. And I didn't have the heart to tell him that Casablanca is not a private movie. <laughs> it's just because Bogart is in it. All right, all right. So I said, okay. And I went home and I wrote like a nine page story. And he loved it. And the investors loved it. And they loved me. And they wanted me to be in the picture. And they wanted me to direct the picture. What they didn't want to do was pay me. Oh, Lord. <laughs> and they said, uh, you go home and write the, the whole screenplay. And if we like it, we'll give you X number of dollars. And I said, well, I'll go home and write it and take it to Universal. What do I need with you? Mm -hmm. So I did go home and I started writing the uh, screenplay because I liked the story. And some small voice back here said, it's a book. Do a book. Mm -hmm. 
So, what I, year was this? This was in approximately 1985. Okay. 84, 85. Uh, and I said, okay, and I started writing the book, and I got 30 pages into it, and I thought, oh my God, this is what I should have been doing my whole life, is writing amazing? books. Because I've always read books, mm -hmm. even as a kid. Uh, and I read every you know mystery by Raymond Chandler and Dash Hammond yeah, yeah. and you know people like that. Uh, so I went ahead and I wrote the book, and then I didn't know what to do with it. And my agent out in uh, Los Angeles didn't know what to do with it uh, because she said uh, at the time she said, "Well, I just know the people at the studios and the networks. I don't know about publishing." Right. So fortunately, a friend of mine read the manuscript, and she called me and she said. Uh, St. Martin's Press in New York is doing a contest for the best first private eye novel. She said, and your your uh, manuscript fits it perfectly. And I said, come on, people don't win contests. <laughs> and she said, just m mail it in. I'll pay the postage if you want me to. I should have let her. <laughs> uh, so I put it in the mail and I forgot about it for about three months. And then I got a call from New York and they said, you've won the contest. Come to... Wow come to Baltimore for the big uh, annual convention, and uh, I was on my way. And that was 27 books ago. 27 books? Well, number 28 is coming out in June. Really? Yeah. Am I in it or anything? Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Let you never know. You never know. Thank you. I'd like to think that I could go down in history as a, a subject in one of your books. I want to mention this, Les. Yeah. The Andy Griffith, you know, that's one of my favorite shows, so Everybody's that's why I keep bringing show. it up. It, uh, um, it, it, was that back in the, the Barney days, or was this in the later days? Uh, uh, Barney had left. He had uh, left. Don Knotts had, had left already, which, I was, which was very disappointing to me, because I just adored what he did. Oh, great, yeah, he he's great. He walks on the screen and you laugh. Yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, at the time, a, a good friend of mine, uh, that I went to school with, George Lindsay. Yeah, you um, went to school with George. Yeah, he, he was playing uh, uh, Goober. Yep. Uh, so, you know, I, uh, you know, I got to hook up with him again for a while, and of course, uh, with, uh, with Andy and with... Uh, so how's, it, how's that work, Les, when you write, say you write a segment or a show, yeah. um, are you on the set with them? No. You know, you, you just write it, submit it, and they take yeah. it? Uh, but you know, I, I visited the set a couple of times yeah, because yeah. I wanted to, you know, I wanted to meet Andy. Griffin absolutely, because, yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, and he was the most astonishing, astonishing man. Uh, and you know, when when we lost him, what was it last year? Yeah. Two years ago. Uh, I, I read stuff about him that I didn't even know. What a what a really astonishing human being he was. Uh, and I'm I'm very thrilled to have written for him. And of course. Um, uh, Opie is now one of the top yeah. movie directors. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, and uh, so, I, you know, I, I had a lot of fun doing it. Of course, we lost uh, George Lindsay here last year as well. Right, right. And uh, I, I, I find it amazing that it seems to me like you had some luck, which I think is part of making it big. I think it, it, anybody has luck, you know, unless yeah. you're digging a ditch. And even that, that's what you want to do, you're lucky. Yeah, you're lucky. <laughs> um, when I was a kid, I always wanted to be, I'm one of these frustrated writers that has written things that's never gone anywhere, but as a kid in, in high school, I remember my teacher saying, Pat, you'll never make it because you're not disciplined. And I find that she was absolutely correct all these years later. You have to be a disciplined person to write. Um, in your scenario, in your case, Les, do you write special times during the day or in the morning, in the evening? How do you do it? Uh, normally, I get up somewhere around seven o'clock. Uh, I have my coffee. Uh, I uh, read the paper, uh, or I, I watch local news. Right. Because uh, I figure I'll find out what's happening, you know, in the world at night. Um, and at about well, whatever you know, whatever time I feel like it, uh, I go into my office, which is twenty-four feet from my bed. Uh, and uh, I, I start to write, and basically I write until two or three in the afternoon. Really? Yeah. Uh, and uh, you know, when I take a break, you got to—you just can't do that. It's not like you know making sausages. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, I'll go on the internet and I'll read my email or I'll get on Facebook or something like that. But basically, I'm there until two or three in the afternoon, uh, and you just have so many hours in a day you can do that. Right. Uh, but then at night, if I have nothing to do, which is rare, but you know, if I have nothing to do, uh, instead of watching some dumb television show, I will go in and I will read what I wrote in the morning. And I will fiddle with it and fix it and change a word here and oh, I don't need that paragraph. Rewrite that that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, and if I don't go in at night, I do that first thing in the morning when I start to work. I'll look at what I did the day before, uh, and I write. Uh, I'm every day. Every day. Seven days a week. Oh. How long does it take you to knock out a, a, a novel? Uh, if I'm left alone, about six months. Six months. Yeah. And then I, to get I'm not it, often left alone, but that's, you know, if, if I just sat there and did it. And then to get it into the publishing state where it's out in the news or the book stands, a year? Well, uh, if you have a New York publisher, uh, uh, things have changed a lot in the publishing oh, sure. business. Uh, it used to be a year, even 18 months. Now uh, I have a wonderful Cleveland publisher, Grain Company. And they'll get it out in three months. Huh. Really? Yeah. Do you, um, uh, and I don't know how this works less anymore. I, I, like you say, things have changed so much. But um, do you get advances then for your, your novels? Sure. So you, that keeps you going. Um, so you don't have to rely on selling every book. Like I've had uh, novelists in here, writers in here that self publish, which you don't do, but they self publish and they have to sell the book to make any money from it. Right. And uh, Well, I get an advance, uh, but then I don't get any royalties until I've earned back the advance. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, uh, yeah, I, I have to go out and sell books, uh, you know, and I, and I hate doing that. Yeah. I mean, my idea when I first started writing books is, you know, you write a book, you put it in the mail, they send you a check, isn't that great? <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, I have to be out there. I have to do radio and TV, right. and uh, I do a lot of appearances. And of course, I'm going to do one, uh, you know, out here in Tupelo yeah. County. And, uh, in when is that, Kathy? Um, that's going to be on Sunday, April 21st. And right. um, tickets are selling out fast for that. It's a free event, but we just checked before we left the library, and... Um, those spaces are filling up, and it's going to be great. It's at, it's at the Red Eagle Distillery, and I know you had those folks on, and that's pretty cool. So uh, their yeah. product is ready to go. Yeah, so we had a great show with them, yeah. the, the fellow that uh, was from that distillery. Yeah. Where they actually make whiskey in yes. Asheville County. That's yes. the first. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. It's a beautiful facility, and uh, Les will be there for three hours. Yes. Thank you very much. Wow, on um, Sunday, too. Yeah, doing um, book talks and book signings, and, um, you know, there there's room for people, but we need to have everyone sign up ahead of time so we can, you know, kind sure. of... You know, knew who to expect, but we're really looking forward to it. It's oh, going I to think be it's a great. great event. I think it's great. You'll have a good turnout. You know, you mentioned uh, less uh, instead of sitting home watching a, a goofy. I don't know if the word was goofy, but the uh, television show. Boy, hasn't television changed since the, the our day when we were younger? Oh, it's it's changed a great deal. Uh, there are even comedies on at, at eight, eight thirty, nine o'clock. Uh, you know, I have grown kids; they do what they want to do. But if I, if I had children. I would certainly never let them watch Two Broke Girls or How I, How I Met Your Mother. Yeah, or, yeah, I agree. Or, or uh, Big Bang Theory, which are funny shows. I, th I think they're very well done, but they're very, very adult. And as far as the the crime shows, and I'm I'm taking taping this one uh, every week and watching it when I have time, just because it interests me because I like the actor Kevin Bacon mm. doing something on Fox called The Following. Yes, my wife loves it. It's so violent. It, it is. is. so. It is overly violent. Yes. I got a buddy out there that, that likes violent shows and, and tough shows. He won't watch wow. that show. Because my wife absolutely loves it. And everybody's talking about it. that show. I haven't seen it. but you got to kind of follow it. You know, she, she, mm. she, uh, she watches every Monday night, I think it is. Yes. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's now got to the point where I think it's getting a little silly. Is it really? Uh, I mean, uh, uh, the bad guy is hi hiding out somewhere, and you have uh, the CIA and the FBI and the, local, the uh, U.S. Marshals and the local police, and they have no idea where he is. <laughs> 
Heck, I could find it. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. I mean, I go back uh, um, to the '60s, obviously, with uh, as a young kid watching um, um, New Heart. Well, Bob New, uh, well, started out with Dick Van Dyke and Jackie Gleason. Right. Um, of course, went on to Bob Newhart. I loved uh, Bob Newhart. The Mary Taylor Moore <laughs> Show. All great stuff. Good that, stuff. That was all Saturday night. All in the family. Uh, Mary Tyler yes. Moore, Bob Newhart, and then... Uh, Even Gleason was a Saturday night with Honeymooners. Yes, and, yes. Uh, and then Carol Burnett after mm -hmm, that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, you know, there was no way of taping anything back then. Mm -hmm. So you didn't go out on Saturday night. You sat there and you watched. And that was great, great stuff. Good TV. Good TV. I, 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 I remember uh, sitting with my mom and dad and sisters uh, watching those shows. I mean, even... And this sounds so klutzy to people probably now that uh, think that, you know, this guy's really old or something. I, I, I am, but, uh, it sucks over there. <laughs> <laughs> Ed Sullivan show on Sunday nights. That was a pastime for yep, our family. Absolutely. You know, absolutely. they don't have variety shows anymore. No, like they that. don't. They you don't. Know. You mentioned some of the, the, uh, stars that you liked in your day and right. the westerns were of course a part of all our lives. I was a, I was a big western fan. Uh, I never missed a John Wayne movie. Uh, <laughs> I now have probably 30 of them on DVD at Do you home, really? and I watch one you know whenever I'm in the mood which is a lot. I also watch a lot of Randolph Scott movies, Joel McRae. One of my favorite movies is uh, Joe McRae and Randolph Scott did a movie together called Ride the High Guy. Ride the High, yeah. Which was the last Sam Peckinpah directed film. Uh, that was and, in the 50s, right? In the uh, 50s. 60s. Was it 60s? 60s? Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, I watch it and I think, oh, these guys are so good. And, and John Wayne, uh, if you watch The Searchers, one of the best movies ever made, yep. one of my five favorite movies of all time, uh, or... Um, uh, Hondo. Rio Bravo, Hondo, uh, all those. The Shootist, the last film he did. Yeah. Wow. I mean, it was incredible, incredible stuff. And I was also very, very much uh, involved with uh, the Bogart films and uh, the Robert Mitchum films. Yeah. And uh, people always ask me if, if uh, they make one of my Milan Yakovich books into a movie, who would I want to play Milan Yakovich? And I always say, Robert Mitchum. But he's dead. <laughs> And if he were alive, he'd be 94. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, he, he's the kind of guy that fills up the screen. And, and he was good. You just don't mess with him. And he was another guy that I knew very slightly. In, in Robert the, Mitchum, you know. Yeah. And, uh, did, where did you come up with your character? I mean, this is an ongoing novel, I mean, a uh, series. Right. Um, how did you come up? Now, you didn't write the first one in Cleveland. You wrote it in Chicago, didn't you? No, in Los Angeles. Was it Los Angeles? Yeah. Why would you pick Cleveland? Okay, uh, in 1987, uh, the Ohio Lottery asked me to come here and to create and get on its feet uh, a game show for the Ohio Lottery, which was called then, and is still called, 104 years later, Cash Explosion. Mm -hmm. uh, so I created that show. and. I can't when, believe you've done all this stuff. It's unbelievable. <laughs> oh, yeah. There's, there's stuff I can't talk about. <laughs> and I was on Cash Explosion. Yes, you were. Yes, you were. I, did you tell me that before? I did. Okay. Yes. But then we were, I, I threw it in there. We were talking about other things, so we'll have to talk about it later. <laughs> uh, anyway, so I, and when I came, and when I decided to come to Cleveland, all I knew about Cleveland was Jim Brown, mm -hmm. Bob Feller, mm -hmm. and the river burning. Yep. And I thought to myself, I'm going to be here for four months and I don't bowl. What am I going to do? <laughs> Within two weeks, I had fallen so completely in love with Northeast Ohio. And uh, I, I was already writing a series of books, uh, uh, private eye books in Los Angeles. Uh, so <clears throat> while I was here, uh, I went to New York for a couple of days and I talked to my editor. And he said, we'd like you to get another series going. Uh, and, you know, I'd, I'd written two already, and I, I was dumb and young, and I said, uh, oh, sure, no problem. He said, but don't do it in Los Angeles, because you're already doing that. I said, okay. He said, and don't do it in New York or San Francisco or Chicago uh, or Boston either, because other people are doing that. I said, well, you've now named every place that I've ever been in my life. <laughs> 
I said, except Cleveland. And he got all excited and he said, nobody's done a Cleveland series for decades. Sure. So when I came back to Cleveland, and I had another two months to, to live there, I started looking around. Uh, because if I was going to do a private eye thing, uh, I wanted to make the private eye a very specific kind of Cleveland private eye. And I found out that um, if you live in Cleveland, chances are you are either Slovenian or Serbian or Croatian or Lithuanian, you're from Eastern Europe. And I started doing some research, decided I was going to make him a Slovenian. Right. Uh, interestingly enough, when I was coming back from New York on the plane, I was sitting next to a very attractive woman, because that's what I do. <laughs> and uh, uh, so I said to her, I'm, I'm new in town, I don't know very many people, you want to have lunch sometime? She said, okay. So by the time we got to lunch, about two weeks later, I had decided on the Slovenian guy, and I started telling her about it. She said, Oh, that's interesting because uh, uh, I'm Serbian. Her, 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 she was married. I still was married. <coughs> she, she said, uh, my maiden name was Jakovic. And I said, oh, that's interesting. We, got, you know, they talked some more. You know, when you met somebody for the first time or something, you talk about your family. So I told her about my children, Valerie and Darren, and she told me about her brothers, Bob and Milan. Milan. And I said, wait a minute, Milan Jakovic. <laughs> I said, that is the most strong, honest, ethnic name I have ever heard. Do you think your brother would mind if I used his name I'll be there. as a private eye? And she said, well, I don't think he'll mind, but he's not a private eye. He's a dentist from Parma. I'll be there. And I am happy to report that, what is it, 25 years later, he is now the most famous dentist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Have you met him? Oh, we're good friends. Is that right? Yeah, sure, we've become good friends. And by the way, he's he's famous only a little bit because of the books. He's quite a guy. <laughs> that's some, some wonderful stuff. Uh, so that's, that's that's how the the character came about. Did and you did you? Um, of course, everybody um, looks at writers uh, as the guys that uh, look at the the street people and they go into bars and they live that kind of life. I mean, mainly when we were younger, probably. Well, but I was going into bars before I was writing. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> me too. Uh, when you went, did you did you get to meet a lot of your characters? Did you base them on people that you met in bars or in different locations? Every character that I write about, I've either met or I've been introduced to or I've seen on the street or in a bar or in the supermarket. And i got to tell you, I never go anywhere without this. This is a recorder. And if I see an interesting face on the street, uh, I will, and you won't even know it, and I will, you know, make notes. And when I get home, I'll put that in my notebook, which is on the computer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, who knows, one, two, five books down the line, you might be reading it and you'll find yourself in it. Oh, you know. I, I, I wouldn't use your name, mm -hmm. uh, but... You're more than welcome to them. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, a lot, a, lot of, a lot of people love that. As a matter of fact, there are, there are many um, uh, benefits that go on, and they contact me and they say, could you donate one of your characters? Donate. One of your, yeah, one of your character names to you know, the, the, the winning bidder, and I do that a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I walk around with what I call the writer's eye. So I look at people, I look at buildings, I look at a dog, I look at a tree, whatever it is. And uh, I probably get anywhere between 10 and 20 ideas a day, whether it's for an entire book or for a scene or for a character. Um, but the ones that I wind up writing about are the ones that are eating a hole inside me trying to get out. I find it amazing because now when you when you do write a book, say with Whiskey Island, yes. this is your latest. Yes. Can we you hold that up, up please? Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Right, you buy that, uh, of course, in bookstores uh, all over the world. But with that book, did you know how it was going to end before yes. you were, before you yes. put it up here? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I I don't do an outline. Uh, a lot of writers do. I right. Have, I have good friends. Robert Crace is a very good mm -hmm. friend of mine. He writes a sixty-page outline. I once said to him. I said, you're writing a 60-page outline. I'm writing 60 pages of my book. Uh, I always know who did it and why. 
uh, and who gets killed, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, what I never know until I sit down at the keyboard is how we're going to catch uh, the killer. Uh, and so uh, a lot of the creativity uh, flows out of my fingers as I'm working. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, very often I'll get halfway through a book and I'll say, okay, this is not going anywhere at the moment because he's done all the investigating that he needed to do, mm -hmm. and I've got a hundred page book here, let's kill somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> so very, very frequently, and I think, I think just about any uh, professional mystery writer that you read, there's always one, more than one death, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, unless it's a major death, you know, somebody tries to kill the president or something like that. My wife's got a, 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 a thing for watching a Lifetime movie network, I think it is. Uh -huh. And she has me DVD it, and then I have to watch them with her. And you know what? Some of these shows are pretty good. They're mur usually murder mysteries, almost like a John Wayne movie. A lot of them are the same premise. I mean, you almost could. We sit, and, and part of our fun evening is all right, this is going to happen next, this is going to happen next, and we sit and talk about that. But a lot of the, um, like, they, they throw different pitches at you where you think you know what's going to happen, and they don't. They don't. And I think that's a good sign of, of good entertainment. I enjoy that portion of it, um, even though there's some of them I don't particularly care for. But uh, I do enjoy a good murder mystery. Well, and that, I, I and think that's so. the thing with your books too. I mean, because it's there are so many characters in so many different scenes that you are presented with all of that. Yeah. You know. Yeah. In each book, and that's what makes it really interesting. Well, uh, it, a lot of those things in my books are what we call red herrings. Uh, I, you know, I'm putting them out there so you're going to think, oh, well, really, he did it, I know. Yep, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. 20, 20 pages later, you're, you're going to know that it's, it was her that did it. Right. You know, that kind of thing. Right. And, you know, the more characters I have in the book, the keep, more confused you're going to be. Keep them guessing. <laughs> sure. Keep them guessing. Uh, and uh, it, it, what's interesting about that, and I, I always tell people this, uh, all the characters in the book, not the regulars who appear in every book, you know, but the characters that I introduce in every book, um, they're not all murderers, but they're all suspects. Mm -hmm. And therefore, they are all, in one way or another, corrupt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know you had a question, Kathy. Well, tell. <coughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> are you going to tell us how corrupt you are? <laughs> right, that was the lead in. Thank you. Thank you for giving me that. Um, no, actually not. But, you know, along with the characters, it's just so interesting to read because of the descriptions that you use about, I mean, not just the Cleveland area, our own area, or other things that you've, you've put into each one of your novels about from Menor to Painesville to Cleveland, to, you know, a store, a shop, uh, a bar, uh, a, a street, a view, and how it's all described. And I like to read it because of that familiarity. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It gives you that, I, I, I know them. Mm -hmm. I need to find out what happens to them because I have that sure. connection. Mm -hmm. Well, I love to write about uh, what I see every day, what, you know, what I look at every day. And <clears throat> I get to downtown Cleveland probably two, three times a week. Um, and I have to tell you that whenever I see the downtown skyline, I feel my blood moving a little really? faster. Uh, I just, uh, um, we had a, a huge convention here uh, in October called the BoucherCon, which is the uh, yearly mystery and suspense convention, and almost 2,000 people show up, writers, fans, everything. Mm -hmm. And we have it in a different city every year, and in 2012 we had it in Cleveland. Uh, and I was giving a talk, uh, I had to give several talks because I was one of the guests of honor, but I had to give several talks and in one of them I said, this is my town. And everybody applauded. <laughs> but I feel like Cleveland is very much mine. I was born in Chicago, mm -hmm. I lived in New York for 10 years, I lived in Los Angeles for 24 years, I lived in Georgia for two years, I lived in Hong Kong for several months, Cleveland. And, and when I say Cleveland, I mean Greater Cleveland is do, my town. Do you, um, of course, you live out on the West Coast, completely different weather. Does that bother you here? No. The, the uh, winters and the, the well, you know, I grew up in Chicago. Well, that's true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Winter, that says know. it all right there. Uh, and 
uh, strangely enough, uh, in the, I've been you know in this area for 22 years, 22 and a half years. Um, there are disasters in almost every other neighborhood. I mean, if you live, uh, you know, down in Tennessee or Arkansas, mm -hmm. uh, tornado tornadoes come through yeah. and blow your whole town off the map, or there's floods, or there's earthquakes. <laughs> Nothing happens here. It rains, snows. So you have to create things to happen, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Uh, so I'm I'm very very comfortable here, and people, you know, after 22 years, people are still saying, "When are you going back to Los Angeles?" And I always say, "When I leave Greater Cleveland, it will be in an urn." <laughs> I just you're going to stay here. I just love it. I just now, you're going to be taking a trip around Asheville County, I think, with Kathy today. Well, I'm yes. around today. Pound I'm around. Pound around. He's um, my buddy. So you could be actually doing location sites for possible future books. Well, one of the reasons uh, that I uh, asked Kathy to spend you know, part of the day with me, uh, besides getting to look at her, <laughs> is... Uh, <laughs> See, it's getting later. I'm warming up. I know, I know. <laughs> I'm in for it today. Huh. Uh, it's <clears throat> because uh, I have the next book in mind. I'm, I'm working on one now that I'm almost finished with. Uh, and I have the next one in mind. And uh, Milan Yakovich and his uh, sidekick, uh, Keo, uh, Kevin O'Banion, mm -hmm. uh, they're going to have to wind, have to wind up in a small town. Uh, and much of it is going to be in a small town. Uh, kind of away from Cleveland, mm -hmm. and it, it shouldn't be any place like you know Nebraska. You know. Right. Just, you know, get in the car and you, you make you know kind of a hefty drive, and you're somewhere else. And uh, when I was here a couple of months ago, and I first met Kathy and all the other librarians from uh, Ashtabula County, uh, I thought, you know, I'm, uh, I should do this here. I was thinking about doing it down in you know like Wayne County or right. one, one of the more Amish communities. It wasn't about the Amish, but, but I thought, no, it, you know, there are small towns up here, but there are, there's a hotel you can stay at. And, right. You know, uh, so I'm, I'm thinking about that. So uh, that's why I have my little uh, recorder with yeah. me. <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to let her talk. I, 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 I get a kick out of the fact that you are, uh, I, mean, I was a newspaper editor before I got retired in 2004, I think it was, but I, I like your, in a reporter before that, but I like your, the fact you have that curiosity of a reporter, that you go out and you want to see different things, you want to meet people, you, you, you're you not shy, you know, and I think that is what has made you an, a very successful writer, because you go out and you add to your repertoire of, of like characters that Kathy said, you have lots of them in your stories. I did get an email here asking you to hold that book up, Kathy. Oh, sure thing. Hey, Matt. Could you do me a favor and zoom in on this book? Um, they can't read it from that far away, I guess. Whiskey uh, they Island. Want to, they want to know the name and the title on the book. And there it is. Whiskey Island Whiskey by Island. Les Roberts. And that is it right there. Perfect. With the skyline of uh, Cleveland. <laughs> yes, yes. Now, whisk, there, there is a Whiskey Island. Uh, there is. Just west of downtown Cleveland. It's not really an island. I don't know why they call it that, but they do. Uh, and it has an astonishing history. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> at the moment, it's kind of a park and a marina and a playground. And uh, there's a fun bar there. And there's a lot of uh, uh, many, many, many privately owned boats uh, moored there. Uh, and I thought this would be fun. And I, uh, I've always wanted to use Whiskey Island as a title. Mm. Uh, Good title. Uh, and yes. and I, you know, so I had to figure out what I could do with it because when I came to Cleveland 22 years ago, it was a, it was a garbage dump. Uh, and I thought, well, you know, what's going to happen in a garbage dump? Not much. But since it, it, it came around, and then I have a good friend of mine, uh, and I mentioned this to her, and she said, well, you know, we're boat under owners, and we're not there now, but, you know, we were at Whiskey Island for years. Let me take you and show you around. So, uh, she did, and I made a lot of notes, and, you know. Uh, I got another email here for you, Les, uh, directed to you. Um, let Mr. Roberts know how much I enjoyed A Carol for Christmas, the play last winter at the Cleveland Playhouse, based on his... Uh, um, 
a short novel. Right. Are there any plans to publish that story in print instead of by e-reader? Okay, uh, first of all, it's called A Carol for Cleveland. Uh, I did not write the play. Eric Kobel wrote the play based on my uh, novella. Um, I don't know if they're going to publish the play or not. I think that is more up to Eric than to me. Mm -hmm. um, I, I guess if somebody wants to, they will. Uh, Eric is a very busy guy. As a matter of fact, he's got a play opening on Broadway uh, this fall, mm -hmm. uh, which I'm very excited about. He's a, he, did, he did such a terrific job with my book because he expanded it and he brought in uh, uh, life before the story started uh, and he had a, a, an astonishing ending and I gotta tell you when I first saw the rehearsal I cried. Wow. Mm. That's how good the ending. But isn't it interesting to take something that you wrote and then someone else put their creative touch on it and then brings it to life? That is such a an interesting process. Well, it was fascinating. For, when they told me they wanted to do this as a play, they said, do you want to write the play? And I said, no, for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, I don't write plays, I write books. Number two, I wrote that story. I told that story. What, what can I do with it? And also, if I took the book and made every page part of the play and nothing more, uh, we'd be out of there in, in 30 minutes. Uh, so, uh, it doesn't doesn't bother you less that uh, somebody took your original and changed it. No, it doesn't bother me at all because it's a different uh, medium. I think if somebody wanted to rewrite the book, I would be very bothered. Mm -hmm. uh, even if they did it better than I did it, I, that's, <laughs> that's my book. I, it, there was a uh, we were talking earlier about uh, mystery writers that I read all my life. One of them was James M. Kane, who wrote. Mildred Pierce and the postman always rings twice. Right. And back in the 40s, uh, he was being interviewed uh, at his home, and the reporter said, Are you upset that Hollywood ruined your books? And he said, Nobody ruined my books. They're right here on the shelf. <laughs> there and that's you go. How, that's yep. how I feel about my books. So if you, you know, if you want to make a movie, I would certainly pray that you made it vaguely <laughs> resemble my books. But if you don't, I've already cast your check. Mm -hmm, right. <laughs> and that's your thing. And if you stop to think about uh, all the great movies that were made out of great books that really respected the books, you can count them on one hand. Mm -hmm. Maltese Falcon, Gone with the Wind, The Godfather, To Kill a Mockingbird. There's another one I can't think of. Either. But that's, that's four movies out of the thousands mm -hmm. that have been made in the last hundred years. So, um, usually, what, 99.5% of them do not follow. And it's book. frustrating as a, as a reader when yes. that happens. Because you, exactly. do, you go into the theater with a certain set of expectations. You know, and it's not just how you visualize something, it's, it's the, the, how the story progresses. Right. And that is the most you know, disturbing thing about it when you, when you encounter it. That's why, I, I just don't understand Hollywood, why they would not... I mean, they're doing so many rehashes of movies that were just made 20, 30 years ago that, that, that doesn't seem that long ago for me, but it's, it seems like they keep bringing these same movies back and redoing them. Why they would not take a, uh, a series like this and make them in, either into a movie or a television movie or a special. You know, I, I don't understand why they're not taking advantage of well, it. Well, they don't take advantage of it because back in the day when we, you and I were younger and there were studios... And the studio had uh, writers under contract, mm -hmm. actors under contract, and they said, "Okay, uh, let's let's take um, Alan Watt. Uh, we got a great movie we want to do uh, with Alan Ladd. It's called Chain. Uh, and we're going to make a lot of money with that because it's a great great movie. But uh, we can't do that for another year and a half, and we got to put him in something else. So let's put him in this other thing. Uh, that's fine, because it's the studio. There are no more studios. Mm -hmm. So now, if they are going to do a movie, even a low-budget movie, they want to make their money back, and they want to make a lot of money. So is it easier to do Whiskey Island that I wrote, 
or is it easy to remake uh, a, a, a movie that was a hit 20 or 30 or 40 years ago? Like Evil Dead. Like Evil Dead. Like Evil Dead is, is absolutely <laughs> right. And, and House of Wax. House of mm -hmm. Wax. You know, that was a great movie with Vincent Price. Oh, yeah. gosh, that was the best. I saw the remake with... with uh, don't even say her name. Don't, don't do it. Don't even say her mm -hmm. name. And I thought, oh, <laughs> my God. <laughs> what have they done? And, and that's a horror movie, and I, I understand that. But there are a lot of... Uh, the Longest Yard with Burt Reynolds. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, fantastic movie. Fantastic prison movie, fantastic football movie. They remade it with Adam Sandler. Mm -hmm. Oh, please. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the great uh, Inspector Clouseau movies with Peter Sellers. Yes. They made two of them with Steve Martin. I love Steve Martin, but he ain't mm -hmm. Peter Sellers. No, mm -hmm. no. He never will be. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, but they do that. They do that, and uh, it aggravates me. And because I uh, also review movies uh, on the radio, um, I have to go see them, Maybe. and I'll, I'll walk in knowing I'm going to hate uh, the Bad News Bears. <laughs> you know, with Walter Matthau, they remade it with Billy Bob Thornton. Yeah. Oh, gosh. No, no, no. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, um, that's what they do, and that's why I think a lot of television, not all television, but a lot of television, is getting better than movies. When they option take an option out on yeah. your stories. Do, do they pay you for that? You bet your bottom Oh, top. right. <laughs> uh, because basically, uh, they say, okay, we want to make a movie. Uh, you want to make a movie out of my book? Okay, give me some money, and then you have a year or two years, you know, whatever we decide on, uh, uh, at which time you either make the movie or forget about it, and it reverts back to me. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I've I've, uh, I've lived on option money. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. See, I don't know how that works. That, yeah. That's interesting to me. Uh, the same with agents. I have a lot of friends that want to be writers and all that stuff. It's hard to get an agent. Um, and uh, obviously you've had agents since the beginning. I mean, you can... Well, I've had the same book agent from the very beginning. Have you? Yeah. It's 27 years. Yeah, that's a long time. Yeah. That's a long time. Um, just and he's years. gotten so old. <laughs> not us, though. Not us. The name of the book. He lives is, in New York. He's not going to hear me. Say. Okay, that's okay. That's safe. The name of the book uh, out now is called Whiskey Island. What's the name of your next one? Do you have a name? Well, yet? Yeah. Well, that's kind of up in the air. It's about harness racing. Really? In Northeast Ohio, and I was going to call it Dead Money, uh, which is a, a racing term for a, a horse that is going to run out of the money. Uh, but I, we discovered that somebody else has written uh, a book with the same title. Mm. It's, it's not anything like my book, uh, but it's with the same title, and it's coming out on ebook uh, a couple of months before mine. Uh, it may be like in May, uh, so I can't use that. And then I came up with something, uh, uh, you know, win, place, and show. Uh, calling it win, place, or die. Mm. Uh, but now that's up in the air too, because I met with my publishers yesterday. Uh, I think the last thing I heard was death on the back, death on the back stretch. Um, so I don't know what they're going to call it, but <laughs> it's coming out in June that okay. I know. Okay. And uh, you know, as soon as I know, I'll put it on Facebook. Sure. And all over the place. So yeah. you had to spend a lot of time at the track, huh? Uh, I, I did spend a lot of time at the track. It's called research. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> not so much watching the races. People watching. People watching. I get. To, I got to go back. You know what they call backside, uh, and I was going to call it backside until I realized there's another meaning to that word. Uh, <laughs> hey, what, do we sell books or not? Come on! <laughs> and, uh, and I loved going back there and being with the horses and feeding them carrots. And they took me, you know, for a jog around the track in one of those sulkies. Uh, and uh, I've, I've been working with a guy. In fact, he, he's getting. Uh, credit as a co-writer on this one, huh. uh, although I wrote basically every word in the book, I had literally a stack of material this much from him, uh, stuff that he wrote down uh, huh. about the characters and about the, the rules and the, the feeling, you know, there, and uh, uh, he is uh, also a horse owner and a horse driver. Uh, they're not jockeys, by the way, they're drivers. Your drivers did not know that. And they don't wear... Uh, 
silks. They were colors. Did ever do that either? I yeah. don't know. Well, there's a lot of stuff about that. But, <laughs> so you'll have to read it. You'll yes, learn these things. Uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, that was the fun part for me. And, uh, uh, I, you know, I've been back there a couple of times. And uh, uh, a couple of months ago, I guess in the, yes, in the fall, uh, I took my girlfriend and her mother there. Mm -hmm. And her mother has never been in the same county as a horse. I mean, she, <laughs> uh, she loves animals, but she's never been near a horse. And now she's feeding them, she's petting them. Is that right? She, she took a, you know, she's in her 70s. She took a, a, a ride around the uh, the track, uh, and they even let her sit on a horse. And she's never right? touched a wow, horse. Wow, that's cool. She was so thrilled. Yeah. They were so thrilled. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's fascinating. And there's a lot that goes on in the book that is uh, on the back side, uh, uh, because all those people are, are very involved. Sure. Or somebody back there gets killed. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> this is just, what a what a great job you have. I really I mean, isn't that you get to experience every day something new. Seriously. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Talk yeah. about lifelong learning. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean. And then it's learning with a purpose. You 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 take what you've observed. You've, and then you've added your own thing to it and created something. It is it is a fascinating process. Oh, well, it is. <clears throat> Several years ago, uh, I, I, I have a good friend uh, in, in Cleveland, and she mentioned to me that her brother had moved to Cleveland, uh, and he was a uh, ceramic artist. And he said, she said, you ought to see the uh, uh, lab that he rented. And I said, well, I'd love to. And it's uh, in the East 30s, uh, just off Superior. Uh, and I, uh, I went up there, and it's an old, 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 old building. It used to be a barbed wire factory, mm. and now it's an artist studio. Huh. Uh, and there's a, a kiln, kiln there that uh, you know gets hotter than even uh, a crematorium. And I'm looking around, and the whole plot just went bing in my head. <laughs> the book, by the, by the way, is called The Duke of Cleveland. <laughs> Les, this has been wonderful. I really enjoyed having you on. This just flew by. This was a lot of fun. Oh, it yeah. Was, uh, it was something. And you'll, you, I think you'll find a lot of different things with Kathy today that are interesting around the area. Right. And, well, uh, I hope so. I'm looking forward to spending some time. But if you want to spend some time with Les Roberts, because this is all very interesting, he is going to be... Uh, join us this morning. Get in the back seat of her car. <laughs> yeah, join us. Right. right. I have two more seats. Two more seats for you. And then we're done. Um, no, join us Sunday, April 21st at the Red Eagle Distillery in Harpersfield. It's Ashtabula County's first and only distillery. It's going to be awesome. Les Roberts will be there. We'll be talking about Whiskey Island. And, and by that time, I'll know the name of the book. Oh, perfect. And he will, he will let us know the name of the book, and we will just be able to have a book talk, book signing, and it's going to be so much fun, and we want you to join us. Absolutely, absolutely. So check it out. And if you need more information on this, get a hold of Kathy at the County Head Public Library. Thank you so much, Les. I appreciate it. Thank you. It. I appreciate it.